وإدريس وذا الكفل كل من الصابرين وأدخلناهم في رحمتنا إنهم من الصالحين وذنون إذ ذهب مغاضبا فظن أن لن نقدر عليه فنادى فظن أن لن نقدر عليه فنادى في الظلمات وذنون إذ ذهب مغاضبا فظن أن لن نقدر عليه فنادى في الظلمات أن لا إله إلا أنت أن لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين فاستجبنا له ونجيناه من الغم وكذلك ننجي المؤمنين وزكريا إذ نادى ربه رب لا تذرني فردا وأنت خير الوارثين فاستجبنا له ووهبنا له يحيى وأصلحنا له زوجه إنهم كانوا يسارعون في الخيرات إنهم كانوا يسارعون في الخيرات ويدعوننا رغبا ورهبا وكانوا لنا خاشعين والتي أحصنت فرجها فنفخنا فيها من روحنا وجعلناها وابنها آية للعالمين إن هذه أمتكم أمة واحدة وأنا ربكم فاعبدوه الله الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين أمين فسبحان الله حين تمسون وحين تصبحون وله الحمد في السماوات والأرض وعشيا وحين تظهرون يخرج الحي من الميت ويخرج الميت من الحي ويحيي الأرض بعد موتها وكذلك تخرجون ومن آياته أن خلقكم من تراب ثم إذا أنتم بشر تنتشرون ومن آياته أن خلق لكم من أنفسكم أزواجا لتسكنوا إليها وجعل بينكم مودة ورحمة إن في ذلك لآيات إن في ذلك لآيات لقوم يتفكرون الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولاه وكم بعد تكون جنيا أسأل الله سبحانه وتعالى تكسفهم الله بسيرة آمين
and to keep us sincere and to allow us to be a beneficial class for all of us. Ya Ameen will begin with the recitation, followed by that, inshallah, we'll jump straight into the analysis. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ثم بدا لهم من بعد ما رأوا الآيات ثم بدا لهم من بعد ما رأوا الآيات ليسجننه حتى حين ودخل معه السجن فتيان قال أحدهما إني أراني أعصر خمرا وقال الآخر إني أراني أحمل فوق رأسي خبزا تأكل الطير منه نبئنا بتأويله إنا نراك من المحسنين قال لا يأتيكما طعام ترزقانه إلا نبأتكما بتأويله قبل أن يأتيكما ذلكما مما علمني ربي إني تركت ملة قوم لا يؤمنون بالله وهم بالآخرة هم كافرون واتبعت ملة آبائي إبراهيم وإسحاق ويعقوب ما كان لنا أن نشرك بالله من شيء ذلك من فضل الله علينا وعلى الناس ولكن أكثر الناس لا يشكرون يا صاحبي السجن أرباب متفرقون خير أم الله الواحد القهار ما تعبدون من دونه إلا أسماء إلا أسماء سميتموها أنتم وآباؤكم ما أنزل الله بها من سلطان إن الحكم إلا إلا إياه ذلك الدين القيم ولكن أكثر الناس لا يعلمون يا صاحب السجن أما أحدكما فيسقي ربه خمرا وأما الآخر فيصلب فتأكل الطير من رأسه قضي الأمر الذي فيه تستفتيان وقال للذي ظن أنه ناج منه اذكرني عند ربك فأنساه الشيطان ذكر ربه فلبث في السجن فلبث في السجن بضع سنين وقال الملك إني أرى سبع بقرات سمان يأكلهن سبع يأكلهن سبع عجاف وسبع سنبلات خضر وأخر يابسات يا أيها الملأ أفتوني في رؤياي إن كنتم لرؤيا تعبرون قالوا أضغاف أحلام قالوا أضغاف أحلام وما نحن 
بتأويل الأحلام بعالمين وقال الذي نجا منهما وادكر بعد أمة أنا أنبئكم بتأويله فأرسلون يوسف أيها الصديق أفتنا أفتنا في سبع بقرات سمان يأكلهن سبع عجاف وسبع سنبلات خضر وأخر يا لعلي أرجع إلى الناس لعلهم يعلمون قال تزرعون سبع سنين دأبا فما حصدتم فذروه في سنبله إلا قليلا إلا قليلا مما تأكلون ثم يأتي من بعد ذلك سبع شداد يأكلن ما قدمتم لهن إلا إلا قليلا مما تحصنون ثم يأتي من بعد ذلك عام فيه يغاث الناس وفيه يعصرون وقال الملك ائتوني به فلما جاءه الرسول قال ارجع إلى ربك فاسأل فاسأله ما بال النسوة التي قطعن أيديهن إن ربي بكيدهن عليم قال ما خطبكن إذ راوتن يوسف عن نفسه قلن حاش لله ما علمنا عليه من سوء قالت امرأة العزيز الآن حصحص الحق أنا راودته عن نفسه وإنه لمن الصادقين ذلك ليعلم أني لم أخنه بالغيب وأن الله لا يهدي كيد الخائنين وما أبرئ نفسي إن النفس لأمارة بالسوء إن النفس لأمارة بالسوء إلا ما رحم ربي إن ربي غفور رحيم بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this a beneficial class and to make Surah Yusuf a reminder for all of us to come back and to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to have true reliance and tawakkul, true complete reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we continue from where we left off last time and today inshallah we're going to be looking at just uh, reviewing quickly, recapping and continuing inshallah from where Yusuf ends up being uh, sentenced to go to jail. I want you to imagine he's innocent, clearly he's innocent. But the ayah, the ayah is ثُمَّ بَدَى لَهُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا رَأَوُ الْآيَاتِ لَيَسْجُنُنَّهُ حَتَّى حين. From 35. So, it occurred to those in charge. Allah says, ثُمَّ بَدَى لَهُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا رَأَوُ الْآيَاتِ لَيَسْجُنُنَّهُ حَتَّى حين. Meaning that the Aziz and his wife, although they have power, they're not fully in charge. This had to be escalated to somebody else. So I want you to imagine from 
Al Aziz's point of view, he knows his wife is wrong and she's not innocent. But if Yusuf doesn't go to jail, his wife is not going to look good in front of others. So he has vested interest in sending his, you know, in, in sending Yusuf to jail to maintain his reputation and to maintain his wife's reputation in front of others. So now they know that the truth is that Yusuf is innocent, but because it's not convenient at all for them, they're willing to, you know, kind of just throw it under the rug and just pretend it didn't happen, just pretend nothing happened. And that's what they're trying to do. But they have to escalate to the judge, to the judiciary. So the question is, what did they escalate to the judiciary? What evidence did they show? Right? What evidence did they show? Did they come up with false evidence? Did they accuse him of something else? Because if it was just about, you know, he said, she said, it was clear that Yusuf is innocent based on the evidence. Some of the Mufassirun say that, no, they manipulated the evidence to say, well, yes, even though the shirt is broke or uh, uh, cut, ripped from behind, it doesn't mean that she was the one chasing. Could have been this, could have been that, could have been this, and they tried to come up with evidence. Others say because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the second ayah, right after the 36, وَدَخَلَ مَعَهُ السِّجْنَ فتيان. Two other people entered into jail with him at the same time. Meaning those three entered at the same time. Yusuf and these other two. They entered jail at the same time. And if they entered jail at the same time, then they must have had a similar basic crime that was attributed to them. And the other two were accused of trying to hurt the king. Trying to basically manipulate his power. One was accused of trying to overthrow him. So imagine um, this is treason. And the other was accused of trying to poison him. This is attempted homicide. And Yusuf was thrown in between them. Like he was somehow involved and implicated. And that's one of the opinions. That Yusuf actually ended up going into jail. But not because of this. You know, not because of the, the, the false accusations against him that he tried to, you know, manipulate somebody. You know, none of that. It was actually this other false accusation that was thrown at him. And that goes to show you, subhanAllah, even though he's innocent, even though he did not make any advances towards that woman, and even though she's the one who made the advances, still, they had to come up with another, right? They had to come up with another set of accusations to throw him in jail. And when he enters into jail, as we discussed last time, instead of him saying, "How? why is this happening to me? Why? What did I do? Why is Allah... None of that. He didn't say any of that. He showcased his goodness to everybody that was there. And this is an isolated, imagine such an isolated group of people with criminals, with people who may not be the best of society per se. People have had some dark history. He still shows goodness to them. And that goes to show you the kind of person that he is. Some of us, we are byproducts of our context. So when we're in a good area, we'll show goodness. But when we're in a bad area, we won't show goodness. We'll show a very different face. But Yusuf is consistent. He's shown good outside of jail to those who've wronged him, to those that have accused him, to those that have thrown him into a well, to those that have sold him into slavery, to those that are with him in jail. Consistently. His saturation, his breaking point, subhanAllah, is much higher than all of us. And each and every one of us has a high, like a melting point uh, at which we break down. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests us within that tolerance but if we're able to really endure in those tests we push our breaking point further and further and further and we build the greater tolerance in being able to really carry that weight and when we build that tolerance Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tasks us with greater responsibility as we'll see in the surah so he comes across two people with him in jail and they build a good enough relationship with him that they're able to trust him with their secret and intimate Concerns, their dreams. And one of them shares, I have seen in my dream that I was squeezing wine. I was squeezing grapes, squeezing, and I was making wine. And the other says, I saw that I was carrying on top of my head. And I see that I'm carrying some bread on top of my head, and the birds are eating from this bread. Tell us what does this mean? For we see you to be a good person. We see you to be from those who always commit to Ihsan. And that's where we get the proof that he was good even in jail. They're saying we see you to be a good person. Even behind bars. We see that you're trustworthy. 
And because not just we see that you're trustworthy, but we see that you're reliable in your dream interpretation. God has given you something that he's not given others. Now listen to this. This is the crux now. This is the narrative of Yusuf, his response to this question. Imagine two people are asking him, what does this dream mean? And we know that Allah gave him the ability to interpret dreams as a gift from him for his patience. And there's more to come. Questions later, please. Jazakallah khair. Now Yusuf could have simply said, this is what the dream means. And this is what the second dream means. He could have interpreted the dream. But he doesn't just interpret the dream. He goes through a sequence of things that he says carefully. First thing that he does is he says to them, he shares with them some of the gifts that Allah has given him. Then he shares a little bit about himself. So he introduces his, his he reassures them that he knows what he's doing. Right? Then he tells them a little bit about himself. You know, intimacy breeds comfort and disclosure. And then after that, he tells them about his own struggles. And then finally he interprets the dream. And in that, there is an example of a formula that you would basically share with people when you're trying to help them, when you're trying to help them, and when you're trying to give them a message that you know is to be good for them. But before he did those four things, he did something else which is equally important. And that is he was consistently good to them. Some of the tafsirs say that, the Mufassirun say that, Yusuf, whenever food would come to him, he would share that food with others who are with him in jail. Whenever they were feeling down, he would spend time with them. And they, you know, there's a lot of anxiety and depression and sorrow in jail. Imagine somebody who's been given a life sentence. There's no way out for them. They know they're there and they're going to die there. And when you come into a conversation with this person, they have no hope. So how do you reintroduce hope to this person? Yusuf was that kind of person who's going around reintroducing hope to these individuals. And now based on his interpretation, based on the dream interpretation, one of those people is going to die. So he wants to take the opportunity to fill that person with hope. To give that person hope to the point that even if they were to die, they would have something better to look forward to than in this dunya. And that's what he's doing here. He's giving da'wah. He's calling them to Islam, calling them to believe in Allah, believe in God, calling them to truth, which goes beyond the material, which goes beyond the context of the jail. Subhanallah. And so the first thing that he does is he builds a relationship with them. Ta'lif. Alif thumma arif thumma ka'lif. That's as they say. Alif. Build a relationship with somebody. You can't teach or advise somebody if you don't have a good relationship with them. If you walk into a place... And you start preaching, nobody's going to listen to you. You start educating, start advising. Nobody's, who, people are going to say, who are you? The first time that I've seen you in my life, why are you asking for... Like, why, why are you even talking? Who are you? So the first thing that Yusuf did, and it wasn't like calculated. You know, some of us are calculated in nature. Like, okay, I need to build a relationship with this guy for five years. So then when I ask him for X, Y, Z, then he's... No, that's not what Yusuf is doing. Yusuf is naturally a good person. And it's naturally happening to him. And that's the difference between... You know, subhanAllah, um, there's a lot of recent literature written on, you know, how to, for example, how to win friends and influence people, right? How to be effective in your leadership. So embody these qualities. Do one, two, three, four, five. People will do one, two, three, four, five. So it becomes very mechanical. It becomes very, very artificial. It becomes very selfish. So even your service to others is self-centered, subhanAllah. But Yusuf is not like that. And Islam, we're not taught to do that. We're taught to genuinely embody this, to change this within us so that these things naturally happen. So when you're reading all of these, you know, literature or whatnot, don't, don't just copy paste without looking at the source, looking at the center and fixing the center. Because when you fix the center, when you fix your core, you will naturally be a likable person. You will naturally be ready to help. You will naturally be ready to serve. You will naturally be ready to give. You will naturally be able to listen better, to articulate. All of these things will come. And you don't do it for the sake of anything. All the prophets and the messages in the Quran, what are they taught to say? لا نسألكم عليه أجرا. لا أسألكم عليه أجرا. I'm not asking for anything from you. I don't want your money. I don't want your loyalty. I'm not running for office. I don't want you to like me on Facebook. I don't want you to follow me on Instagram. I want nothing from you. There was no Facebook and Instagram back then. But that's the idea. Right? The prophets, all of them said that. Not looking for anything back in return. We're looking to convey a message and to give you this way of life. And it's up to you whether you want to choose it, commit to it, or whether you want to dismiss it and ignore it. Right? 
So think about this, subhanAllah, in, in, in the context of the jail. So what does he say to them? How does he do this? The first thing that he says, after he's built this relationship with them by, through goodness, he says, لا يأتيكم طعام ترزقانه إلا نبأتكم بتأويله من قبل, قبل, قبل أن يأتيكم. This ayah here, this section, is interpreted in many ways. Let's read it literally first. He says, No food will come to you except that I tell you about it before it comes to you. Okay, so what is it here? What is he talking about? Some of the Fasurun said, he wants to basically get them to calm down. You know, someone asks you a question, and you're like, okay, you have a question, but guess what? Let me tell you about my life. Let me tell you about my health. Let me... Like, Habibi, I don't care about your life. I just want the answer to the question. So he wants to disarm them by saying, no, be, I, will be, I will tell you, literally, I will tell you the meaning of your dream before the next meal comes. So he already gives them the duration of time that he's going to take. This is you saying to somebody, look, I will, I will give you the answer, but the answer will require 35 minutes, 40 minutes. You okay with that? We're okay. Khalas. So you have their buy-in. They know what to expect. So, that's the first thing. That's the first interpretation. The second interpretation, based on the, just the arrangement of the words, no food will come to you except that I will tell you about it, not about the dream, but I will tell you about it, the food, before it comes to you. Meaning, in order for me to build that trust, you, like I'm not going to just claim anything without showing you proof. The thing that Allah has given me within this you know, confines of the jail, is I'm able to tell you what's going to happen to you before it happens to you. That's part of prophethood, is you have a share of knowledge about the ghaib, the unseen. So I will tell you about the kind of meal before it comes to you. Okay, that's the second interpretation. So I will tell you the next meal is going to come. You're going to get some chicken, you're going to get some soup, uh, you're going to get nothing. As an example. The third interpretation is, yes, he will tell them about the kind of food that will come to them, but he will use the kind of food that comes to them to actually help his interpretation of the dream. So he's asking both of them, show me the meals that you're getting from the guards. Because those will tell me whether you're in for a death sentence or in for a temporary imprisonment. He's been noticing that there are certain meals that are given to those who are going to be sentenced for life. Those who are going to be close, yani they're going to be called to be put on death row. And those that are going to be there for some time. And he's noticed that he picked that as a pattern and that's what he's going to tell them. So before the next meal comes, show it to me and that will guide me in, your, in the interpretation of the dream. The, and, and, and those are all subhanAllah any valid interpretations. But of course the most, imp, the most relevant interpretation is that he's telling them, I will tell you about the next meal before it comes. Because what comes after this is This is not because of me This is not in, you know, intrinsic to me This is because of what my Lord Has allowed me to learn Now let this sink in Let this sink in This man who was thrown into the well By his brothers This as a young boy This young boy who was sold into slavery Tempted and blamed And imprisoned Despite all of that his patience, his reflection led him to be in a position where Allah bestowed this really, really special knowledge onto him. And Ibn al-Qayyim says that the more you're patient in your pursuit of truth and justice, regardless of all the opposition, the more knowledge that Allah will give you. We made them into leaders and sources of guidance for others when they were patient and when they endured. Have protection over the boundaries that Allah has set and Allah will teach you. So there's this connection between taqwa and knowledge. So you know what that means? That means if you're not in a position of taqwa, you can't trust your insight and knowledge. If you're not praying fajr on time, if you're not praying salat on time, if you're not praying tahajjud, if you're not in that close connection with Allah, your compass is not clear. So you're not going to see clearly. And if you don't see clearly, you can't trust your intuition. You can't trust your knowledge. You know, a lot of people say, follow your heart. But if, if, you're, you know, if your heart is full of dust, 
And if your heart is constantly being exposed to this wrong, if you're listening to this all the time, noise, if you're exposed to this noise all the time, you can't expect your heart to be a reliable compass because you're not feeding it, you're not fueling it the right, the right stuff. But if you have that iman and you're committed and you're constant, the Prophet Muhammad says, Stafti qalba. Follow your heart. When you're, when you're going for a fatwa and you go to this sheikh and you go to the sheikh and you're going around shopping for a fatwa and this person says it's okay, this person says it's not okay, this person says in, in When you have all these fatwas, the Prophet Muhammad said, look into your heart and you will know which one is truly worth following and which one is not. Because you know your situation best. And you know whether the accommodation that's given to you is deserved or undeserved. But that comes with iman. That comes when you cultivate faith and when you bring yourself closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then, so he gives them the proof. He first shows them he's re, like that he's reliable, that he's trustworthy. Just like you walking into a, a doctor's office. The doctor's not going to tell you, I studied in Harvard, I did this and this 18 years of experience. What is the doctor going to do? Boom. In the background, all of the certificates. Oh, yeah, you went to university. Oh, wow, 15 years. A college of physicians or this and this and that. Or that's, that's like your portfolio as a, as a graphic designer. It speaks for you. It, it does the khalas, your resume as, a, as anybody. So that's, that's doing that for you. And that's the first step in gaining credibility. You've served people, but you have the credentials. You have something to show that proves it. And then what does he say? And notice here, this is somebody who's in jail. He hasn't went to school. He doesn't have the credentials that we usually have. But yet still Allah gave him knowledge. And that teaches us, subhanAllah, what this whole story teaches us never to undervalue people's knowledge. You know, some of us think that somebody who's been in, in, you know, behind bars for years, we don't you know, look at that person as someone who's worthy of our respect. But here in this surah, we're literally taught to respect that person. That person becomes a source of guidance for everybody else. So you don't know what knowledge can be given to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there are lots of deep forms of knowledge that you may not understand, you may not be fully exposed to, that somebody else in a restricted position may have access to, where you are living a, a, a free life, you would never be able to acquire this knowledge. So there's another reminder in all of this to never be little people. To never be little people. Right? Some of the greatest explanations have been given by people who did not go to school or study they, just, they were just in tune with their nature. And when you're in jail for that long, you're in tune with your nature. Two explanations are accessible. Some people, they've been, you know, subhanAllah, they've been reading books for years. Hundreds, thousands of books. And they can answer a question, but it's so complicated. It's so technical. You're listening and like, I don't even know what you said, man. What, have you, what are you talking about? They, they've, be, they've become so removed from the practical reality of people's life and people's experience. That their advice is no longer practical. So think about what knowledge means here. What is Allah teaching us about knowledge? And then what does He say to them? He says to them, "And inni taraktu millat qawmin la yu'minun billahi wa bil akhirati hum kafirun." So He tells them, "I left a people that did not believe in Allah, that did not believe in God. These people were atheists. I left them, and now, and they were those people when I left them. They were in complete denial about God and the hereafter." So what is he saying by this? What is he saying? He says, he's saying to them that I too had to leave certain things behind. So I can relate to you. Not only am I in jail being able to relate to your context, but I had to give up certain beliefs. And I had to give up certain ideologies and leave that. So what is he saying to them? When he says, I did this, what is that, what is that, in, you know, what does that do to the person listening? Means what? If Yusuf left things that he did not believe in, things that did not make sense, I should do the same. So you're, you're teaching by modeling. He's not telling them, you need to change your life. You need to let go of this. You need to let go of that. He's saying, look, I left this, these people behind. I left them behind. Right? And in another interpretation, it's as if he's saying, now that Allah has put you in this context, perhaps Allah removed you from people who don't believe in Allah and His Messenger, who don't believe in Allah and the hereafter, and He's put you in this space so that it becomes an opportunity for you to reflect. He's teaching them to think optimistically about their experience. That you may be here for a reason. There may be a purpose to this. And then what does He say? And I followed the way of life of my, par my parents, my family, 
Now here we see that the word Aba doesn't just mean dad. It, just, it means the whole lineage. Father, grandfather, grand, great-grandfather. And he mentions where he comes from. So again, he's telling them about himself. He's building a relationship with them. Right? And then he says, مَا كَانَ لَنَا أَن نُشْرِكَ بِاللَّهِ مِنْ شَيْءٍ ذَلِكَ مِنْ فَضْلِ اللَّهِ عَلَيْنَا وَعَلَى النَّاسِ وَلَكِنَّ أَكْثَرَ النَّاسِ لَا يَشْكُرُونَ And how, is it, how can we ever associate with God anything else? And this gift that God has given us is from His grace. We don't deserve it. So look at the humility. I don't deserve this. It's a gift that God has given me. And it's a gift now that I feel the need to share. وَعَلَى النَّاسِ And I have the duty now to share this gift with others. But most people are ungrateful. Then he continues, Ya sahibi decision. Oh, my companions in jail. What a nice, like my jail buddies, my pals. It's, it's, it's it, like in, in Arabic, it's very, like it breaks those barriers. Like we're, we're buddies here. We're in the same, you know, we're, we're in the same zone together. After introducing himself, explaining where he comes from, explaining what he gave up, the beliefs that he gave up, now he's going to ask them a rhetorical question. And this is important in Dawah. You ask questions. Right? Is one Lord, right? Is which is better? Many, many different lords that you have to serve or one? He's like saying, imagine you have to answer to so many bosses. What makes more sense? Answering to multiple bosses or having one chain that you report to? You know, I remember back in the day when imams would uh, sit and talk with each other. One of the uh, biggest complaints that people have, the imams have, is when you're an imam, you have 500 bosses. Everybody who is a member of the masjid is your boss. Salaam alaikum. You know, we, we don't like the adhan is too long. The salah is too long. The salah is too short. I uh, don't like this. Don't like that. It should not be 130. It should be 135. should be 12. Everybody has something to say. And it's not, it doesn't come as a suggestion. Alhamdulillah, this community is much better. But in other communities, it doesn't even come as a suggestion. It comes like, you do this or you're out. <laughs> Subhanallah, so you're trying to serve people. So the same thing applies here. What's better to have? A united chain of commands or you're answering to these multiple deities. And what he's saying is simplifying the notion that monotheism and tawheed makes more sense logically. You can't have multiple gods in charge of the universe. Otherwise, there will be chaos. Who answers to who? Who's responsible for what? Is there an ultimate God? Is there an ultimate, like the o OG, the, the, the original God? Yeah. So do they report it? Like the, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about that in the Quran. لَوْ كَانَ فِيهِمَ آلِهَةٌ إِلَّا اللَّهِ لَفَسَدَتَا Had there been more than one deity, the earth would have been destroyed. The earth would have you know, wound itself up because there would be contradictions. So the constancy with all of its manifestations in the universe points to one designer, one maker, one lord. And he's asking them here, could, like how could we believe in multiple lords and submit to multiple lords when it makes sense only to believe in one? Who is this one? He introduces this one. Al-Wahid, Al-Qahar. So asking rhetorical questions. And after asking the rhetorical questions, he talks about the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this goes to show you in da'wah, there's certain things that you need to do. You develop your relationship, you introduce yourself, you, as, you, know, you, you, you demonstrate your worth, your, your capacity, your credentials. You, talk, you build that relationship with the person, you share a little bit about yourself so people can relate to you. And then you ask these rhetorical questions, you introduce Allah, and in introducing Allah, He says, Al-Wahid, the one, Al-Qahar, the Supreme. The one that is able to control everything and no one controls. The one that everything needs and depends on, but, no, but, but does not need nor depend on anybody. Al-Qahar. And then it explains all the, all the things that are existing. Because they're going to ask, well, what about this God? What about this way of life? What about this religion? What about that religion? What about the, the religion that I'm worshipping? What about my family traditions? What, what do you have to say about those? So he says very simply, مَا تَعْبُدُونَ مِن دُونِهِ إِلَّا أَسْمَاء سَمَّيْتُمُهَا أَنْتُمُ آبَاؤُكُمْ The things that you worship besides Him, Allah, are just things that you, they're just names. They're just names. They're abstractions. They're creations that people have come up with. They've invented. You've invented them. And your forefathers, your grandparents, the older generations have invented them. So much of other religions is based on what? Innovation and invention. 
inventing a false god and attributing powers to it, literally completely non-factual, literally fabricated, or innovation, additions within the same religion. Like what we say about our Christian brothers and sisters. They took the messenger and they made him the message. They took Isa, who was a messenger, and they made him the message. They made him salvation. They made Isa the messenger, God. Right? So, it's, it's the same. That's what he's saying here. Ma anzalallahu biya min sultan. God did not reveal this. He's not authorized this. This is made up by humans. In al illa lillah. And at the end of the day, the command and the ruling and the power only belongs to Allah. Amara Allah ta'abudu illa iya. He commanded that he should be the only one worthy of worship. That he's the only one to be worshipped. ذَلِكَ الدِّينُ الْقَيِّمِ That is the good way of believing. That is the upright faith. You're looking at how to choose the religion, how to choose your way of life, how to choose your faith. Look at the faith that is upright. This is the upright faith because it makes sense. It appeals to your logic. It appeals to your, you know, your, your spiritual, your uh, emotional aspects. It appeals to everything within you. But most people don't want to engage in this. Most people don't want to know. Most people don't want to learn. Right? You engage in a conversation with somebody and they don't want to give up their way of life. They're like, this is the way I, please, I don't want to. And, you know, it could be this, it could be that. It's uh, multiple paths to God. Most people don't want to engage in that conversation deeply. Why? Because it requires a clear mind. Do, do most of us have clear minds? Do most of us think about this stuff? We don't. We have only the bandwidth to think about what? To think about work? Kids, family, right? And and subhanAllah, you have to ask yourself, even in these, you know, in these changes, Yani, in, in the modern world, in the modern world, right? Uh, there's no slavery, right? There's no slavery, right? Supposedly. <laughs> ah, supposedly. Right? There's still slavery in Canada. There's no slavery in Canada. You hope. Okay. <laughs> Those are two statements that need to be reconciled. But nonetheless, um, look, the old, like the slave in the Arab world, what was the slave? What was the slave in the Arab world? You cannot travel without permission. You cannot take days off without permission. You need to show up for a specific time a shift, at least a third of the day that is committed to work. The person that is your master gives you, you know, housing, gives you basics, you know, living expenses, and on top of that, like a stipend so that you, you know, build your way up, but never too much that you become fully autonomous or independent too quickly. Now let me ask you again. Is there modern slavery? Yeah, we are. This modern employment. Modern employment. And that's why the Prophet Muhammad Sallam encouraged the community to be what? To be business, business people, right? Like it's if if you're working for somebody else, let me be, be very explicit. Right? If you're working for somebody else, you are engaging in some form of slavery. There's no housing. Yeah, they don't even give you housing. Basic shelter is gone. You we'll give you money to cut like subhanAllah, and then we'll tax you on that money. It's, like, it's crazy. <laughs> it, Allah, I think about it, right? Okay, now we're talking. Huh? Everybody's woken, mashallah. Like, we're all slaves. <laughs> Down with the matrix, astaghfirullah. <laughs> yeah, those who know, know. Anyway, so, so, ask yourself, ask yourself, what, like, who stands to benefit from certain changes? You know, certain, even, even, subhanAllah, like, um, you know, in, in the Middle East, when they were carving up the Middle East into like different nations, you know, you have, you have certain demographics, right? You want to make sure that the Sunnis are sandwiched with like one Shia, right? You want to make sure that the Alawis are close in proximity to this and that. So you're, you're, you're carving it in a way where you keep people busy with each other. You keep people busy with each other. Because as long as people are busy fighting each other, what do they not have time to do? Think. Right? They don't have time to think. So what happens when you do the same, not just on national levels, what happens when you do the same on family levels? What happens when you change laws in a way and start like sending messages in a way where you turn 
wife on husband and husband on the wife. And you turn children against their parents and you turn parents against their children. Right? And we know this to be now like, this is actually done intentionally. Even within nations before, uh, before uh, elections. Right? You know, we're going to send, we're going to identify you based on your, res- your, your search uh, history. You're blue, you're red. Okay, blue. Feed all the blue, all the bare, bad things about red. Feed red, all the bad things about blue. And now you have people fighting. Internal division, right? And, and take it to the max. Take it to the max. And keep people fueled with distrust. And within the Muslim community, same thing. Right? Let's pin any difference that you can. Hanafis against Shafi'is. Malikis against Hanbalis. Hanbalis against this. The Salafis against the Sufis. The Sufis against the Salafis. And subhanAllah, often the cases, you know, these become real heated debates. But if you were to actually, for the most part, there are differences, of course, there's no doubt, and we have to be clear about that. But 85, 90% of the, of the things that unite us, we ignore those and we focus on the 3% or the 10% that divide us. And if you were to give somebody, if you were to give somebody, like a book written by, you know, let's say, for example, you, you, you were to give a, and this actually happened, by the way, the, there's a true story. Without mentioning the names, there was a sheikh who was in prison, put in prison in Egypt for the radical things that his, the, you know, the violent things that his students did. And what happened, subhanAllah, is the, the students would be shown books, books that their teacher has written, their teacher, but they would change the name. They would change the cover. They were like, this was written by the enemy, you know, the other side. They would open it up like, Astaghfirullah, haram. How can they say this? La hawla wa la. This is Jahannam. No wonder why we're fighting them. Yeah? Subhanallah. And then you would do the opposite. You would give them books written by the other side, but you put the name of the teacher on them. Like, wow. So sophisticated. I've never read this before. Hmm. Makes sense. I can actually see. Like, it's on the edge. Like, you know, some, some of our people would have problems with it, but it's said by our guy. It must be good. This actually happened. True stories. And a lot was done, especially in Egypt. When you're in jail, you, you got nothing better to do, right? <laughs> so you do these little social experiments. SubhanAllah, and this is, this is what happens, right? There's all these biases that we have, and there are certain things that are going to, or certain entities, intentionally or non-intentionally, entities that stand to benefit either on a global level, social level, even national level, local level. And sometimes, you know, a lot of people are implicating this. They're good and innocent. But they, they're not thinking too much, but they're part of the, the system. Innocent, implicated members within a system. Uh, they have to think about that. So when, when we're, what he's doing here is he's getting them to you know, think about where you stand. Think about your positionality. Think about what you've inherited. Think about the assumptions that you have. How many of those are actually true? He's engaging in this conversation with them. I've had to leave a community behind. And you're here for a reason, you're here for a purpose, and he's having this conversation with them. And then finally, after all of this, explaining to them what true freedom is, what true liberation is, letting go of all of that, and, and give your space, give your mind the clarity required to think. And when you think naturally, your fitra, your fitra will wake up. Your intuition will wake up. And that fitra will guide you to finding the truth. All you have to do is just remove the noise. Sins could be noise. Other distractions could be noise. Right? And once you remove all of that noise, you sit with yourself, you'll start asking questions like, why are we here? What are we doing? What's the purpose of all this? And these questions will guide you to waking your fitra up. And naturally what happens as your lenses are being clear, you pick up the revelation and it speaks to you. It guides you. It, 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 it shows you the path. And he's given them all this in a very simple conversation. And then finally he answers the question. Ya sahibi sijn. Oh companions in jail. Now, his interpretation is that one of them is going to do what? One of them is going to leave jail and serve his master, khamra. And the other one is going to be crucified and the birds will eat from his head. But does he say which is which? He doesn't say which is which. It's slightly obvious, but it's not. Because dream interpretation is, is, is complicated. The guy would... 
That's true. It may be kind of obvious, right? But he doesn't say it. Because he still wants to give both of them hope. Right? And then he still says, at the end of all this, وَقَالَ الَّذِي ظَنَّ ظَنَّ Like this is all based on one. It's, it's based on, you know, it's, you're never fully 100% accurate in your dream interpretation. Anybody's dream interpretation. And what happened, subhanAllah, is the Prophet Muhammad said, this is a true story, was approached by somebody who had a question about dreams. And then the Prophet ﷺ told Abu Bakr, you interpret the dream. Abu Bakr interpreted the dream. And then the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, what did he say? He said, you've, you've asabtal akhtata. You have said, you've, you've done well in interpreting a lot, but there were some errors. There were some gaps. And this is with Abu Bakr. What about the rest of us? So especially outside of prophets and messengers, dream interpretation is always speculative. There's an element of speculation. So don't take a dream interpretation and be like, khalas, this is it, I'm doomed, or I'm meant for greatness. There's still an element of like, do the best that you can and exert, and don't rely too much on dreams. The man, they're important, they have their place, but don't be too reliant on that. So he says to them, one of you will serve wine to his master, meaning he will be freed, and he will go back, and even though he was placed in jail with the... um, with the charges of trying to do bad against this master, you will be absolved of your charges. That's the, that's the impression here. And the other one, unfortunately, will be crucified. Now, خلاص, we've done, we're done. The story is over. خلاص. Meaning, I'm not going to provide more clarification. That's it. We're going to leave it at that. Now, quickly, they change the conversation. Some of the Israeliyat, they say that once they heard this answer, they tried to retreat. They tried to retract the statements, especially the one that thought he was going to be killed, it's like, but no, that, 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 the dream didn't happen. I made it up. Okay. <laughs> it's, you know, so, so like, subhanAllah, the denial, the denial. But it's coming from the Israeliyat. Allahu alam, how true that is. And then then Yusuf said to the one that he knew would survive, that he thought would survive, mention me to your master. Meaning when you get out of jail, mention my name. Mention me. Because I'm falsely imprisoned. Remember me. He didn't say anything else. Didn't say, didn't say, say that I'm innocent. I need you to do this for me. None of that. Just mention me. If you get out, all I need from you is just to mention my name in front of him. So he doesn't forget about me. Maybe that will trigger him to open up the file, to revisit the file. فَأَنْسَاهُ الشَّيْطَانُ ذِكْرَ رَبِّهِ But shaitan made him forget the remembrance, remembrance of his Lord. فَلَبِثَ فِي السِّجِنِ بِضْعَ سِنِينَ That he re- remained in jail for many years. Now who forgot what? Some say that Yusuf, Yusuf forgot to remember Allah in being reliant on this man. He said, remember me in, in front of your Lord. So it's as if he's, he's now relying on somebody else for the first time, instead of relying on Allah. And for that reason, he was punished by the man forgetting, so he would spend more time in jail to learn to have the full reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A lot of the Muslims say this is a very problematic tafsir. Because you're attributing lack of, like, lack of remembrance to a prophet, a messenger. And you have to be careful, there's got to be adab with the way that you talk about this. So they tried to find a way around this, in two ways. One opinion said that this, the, the Prophet Yusuf intended to get out of jail. He's been in jail for like five years at least. He's intended to get out of jail with the intention of giving da'wah to the king. Doing good in the world. So shaitan does not want shaitan does not want Yusuf to get out. Shaitan wants Yusuf to stay in. So shaitan fa'ansahu shaitan wa dhikra rabbihi. Shaitan made this other man forget the mention of Yusuf or made Yusuf forget the mention of Allah so that he would spend a little bit more time in jail. And then the others said no, that Yusuf did remember Allah, mention Allah, meaning, and I, you know, I ask you in the name of God, do mention my name when you're in front of the Lord, in front of the master, in front of the king. But the man ended up leaving and got so excited, years, you know, you get out of jail, you've been in jail for some time, five years, if we know that they went into the cell at the same time. So he's so excited going back to his, you know, life and he completely forgot about Yusuf. Either way, we know Yusuf was not mentioned. 
And imagine the feeling you would, and I mentioned this before to you. Imagine you spent five years with somebody in jail. You were good to this person. You helped this person. You did all of these things. And the first thing, the only thing you asked of this person, don't forget my name with your Lord. And that guy completely forgot about you. Oh, the wound, the wound. Some of, some of us, we may pretend to have moved on, huh? But we don't. We don't. We hold that grudge. We never forget, huh? I will always remember. Think of the motto. I will always remember. But Yusuf was the, like, subhanAllah, it's okay. And that shows, that shows in what is to come. He show, he's completely reliant on Allah. So there's just internal peace. Nothing is going to distract or upset that. Finally, وَقَالَ الْمَلِكُ Now pay attention to the words here. The language is very important. وَقَالَ الْمَلِكُ Then the king one day said, إِنِّي أَرَى سَبْعَ بَقَرَاتٍ سِمَان I see in the present tense. Now, remember, all the other dreams were said in the past tense. إِنِّي رَأَيْتُ Right? رَأَيْتُ I've seen, I've seen, I've seen. But here it's in the present tense. I see, I see, I see. It's as if he's, it's as if the king is seeing this in front of his eyes. This vision or this dream is so vivid that he can't forget it. And he's seeing it over and over again. It's repeating. I see seven cows, siman, that are big, that are large. They're being eaten by seven small, thin, skinny cows. And seven green ears of grain. So they're, they're green, they're fresh. And then others that are dry. And by coupling the two, you know like in, in ratios, you assume what happened between A and B will happen to C and D. So the students say that because the, because the uh, skinny cows were eating the fat, the big cows... The, um, the, green, the green ears are being eaten by the skinny, dry ears of grain. It's, like it's a dream, right? It's a dream. There's a lot of creativity in dreams. Uh, you, you're very creative. I've, I've heard some of your stories before. Now listen to this because there's a lot to say here. There's a, there's a lot to say and, and I don't want to get too much into detail, technical detail that we lose track of the big picture. But he says to them, Ya ayyuhal mala'u. Al mala, like all of the people that fill up the quarters of the king, the, all the stakeholders, the important people. He's not just speaking to a small group of advisors. <coughs> He's had to go to the largest gathering of stakeholders, like all the business people and all of the important people in the community. And he's saying to them, Aftuni fi Help me. Give me a fatwa. Help me. Give me an answer. I need an opinion about this dream. In kuntum ta ta'abirun. In kuntum ta ta'abirun. If you're able to truly interpret dreams. Now why is he saying in kuntum ta ta'abirun? What does this tell you about the king? What, what position is he in? He just put three guys into jail five years ago. Right? And now he's saying to people, if you truly are able to interpret dreams, in kuntum, if you really are able to interpret dreams, I want an answer for this. It means that there's a lot of distrust in this time. And this king is struggling to hold on to power. There's a lot of turbulence. Right? And because this dream keeps coming over and over again, he needs an answer. And there's very little that he can trust. So he's not going to speak to a closed in the, a group of... He's going to speak to everybody hoping that someone will have a vested interest to come up and to say something. So what did they say to him? They said to him, these are, these are confused visions that you see, confused thoughts that you have in your mind. And we don't know the interpretation of these dreams. This is not a vision. This is, not a, this, is not, this is not a vision. We only interpret visions. But this is nonsense. So it shows you again two things. Number, like, uh, uh, you could say people are reading too much into it, but this is what the Fasurun have said. They've said that there's a lot of distrust and these people don't want to come off as ignorant 
but nor do they want to give an interpretation because what happens if the interpretation doesn't come true? They're going to be in trouble. So the best way out is to say, this is not the category of dreams that we interpret. I'm very specific when it comes to like the things that I deal with. This is beyond my capacity. Sorry. But this is, you know, I, we don't deal with this stuff. We can't do it. Then finally, look at the opportunism. Wow, subhanallah. This is such an incredible image. The guy who was saved, the survivor, the ex-prisoner, right? What does he say? He remembered. Finally, he iddakara, not is like tadakara. Tadakara means he put effort to remember. He didn't iddakara literally the, 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 the dot on the dal is taking out. You'd imagine removing a part of the letter to show you that it wasn't even he didn't actually remember. It's like it's like imagine in English, it's like you're writing, finally he remembered, but you take the E out. You take the E out of remembered. So it's like R E M. B R E D. And then someone says, Bro, you misspelled it. Like, no, it's intentional. What do you mean? I removed the E because it's too late. Right? It's like too late. Like, what kind of, like, it's like, you're, it's like the memory itself is, is, is so late that it's as if you didn't fully remember. It's not like it's just opportunistic. Right? And he remembered too late. So it's kind of like that kind of play on words or play on the language. What dakara ba'd the ummah? Now what is Ummah? Ummah means a whole nation. Like a whole, like it's, it's as if he remembered a generation later. Allah's, Allah's, like he finally remembered after like nations rose and nations fell, things like a whole history changed. It's like, you know, he, like a, after the dinosaurs became extinct, he finally remembered. This is really, this is really interesting, an interesting like style in the Quran. So what does he say? Ana unabbi'ukum I will tell you its interpretation. So what is he trying? He doesn't even say Yusuf. I know this guy named Yusuf. He's a really good person. He's an interpreter. Like, no, 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 no. I will tell you the interpretation. But what I need from you is to send me with a clear mandate back to prison. He wants a permission to go to visit to go to visit the prison, but he doesn't want to get stuck there. Right? <laughs> so he's like, I need, I need to go, I need a, a special permission. To go visit, I can't tell you who. Right? Creating suspense, or he's thinking maybe I'm gonna go get the information. No, nah, okay, like, we'll, 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 you know, people are very opportunistic. I'll, I always want to have something in my pocket. Like I'm not gonna, I'll, I'm not gonna reveal all my cards. I'm not gonna reveal all my information. <laughs> so funny. He's telling her to. Just a few, a few months ago, he was the one that was coming up, and now he's controlling his sister, mashallah. May Allah bless you. May Allah bless you and give you Tamam. Ta'arsilun. Now, what does he say? What does he say? He goes, to, find that he goes to prison. He has the special permission. And he goes and he visits Yusuf. Uh, now that you need something from Yusuf, what are you going to say? Yusuf, ayyuha siddiq aftina. Oh, Yusuf, the honorable, trustworthy man. Oh, honorable, trustworthy, yeah? <laughs> if this was anybody else but Yusuf, he would have been like, listen, Habib, what do, I, what do you mean honorable? Oh, it's so honorable, huh? You remembered how honorable I am now. What do you want? What do you want? <laughs> but Yusuf listens. So he says, Aftina, answer, answer. Give me an answer regarding, now, subhanAllah, imagine this man is coming back to see you after all these years, there's no explanation. There's no, how are you doing? How have you been? Are you okay? I'm so sorry I forgot. So how things happen. None of that. He just says, Yusuf, oh honest, trustworthy man. I need an answer quickly. I need an, like the urgency. I need an answer. Regarding what? So there's seven cows eaten by seven skinny ones. They're big, big cows. Right? And then there are seven small, like uh, ears of uh, grain that are green, and those are being eaten by seven dry grains. And then he says, he doesn't want to say, look at this, he doesn't say, I want to go back because this is a dream that the king had. So they can go back and inform the people so that they would know what to do. So he doesn't mention that it's a king. 
that there's he doesn't even mention it's a dream just gets into it because he knows that you use of your dream interpreter we know that you know let's get into it. here's the dream here's what was seen give me the answer so i can go in, go inform the people save the people i want to save the people you, you don't want to you of course you're a good person so help me save the people oh man how often this happens huh the guy that you're abusing in your institution now your institution is in trouble and he's the one with the numbers. He's the one with the information. So you come to him. Oh dear, uh, you know, uh, you know, I, I have. We haven't been talking much lately, but you know, um, you've always been a man of grace. So reliable. I need this report so we can save the organization. You do the report. Oh, this, is, this happens, right? Lots of examples in your own life. I'm sure you can come up with many. But this is an opportunistic individual. And Yusuf could have simply said no. <laughs> Subhan, look at the test from Allah. Yusuf has the capacity to destroy the whole country by not interpreting this dream. And he could say, I'm going to hold on to that power. I'm, <laughs> you're not going to give you that dream interpretation. Right? But what does he say? He said, without any... You should apologize. Where have you been this whole time? I know this. Allah already told me this is the dream of a king. And you're concealing that information. You're an opportunistic person. He overlooks all of that. And he says, Now my brothers and my sisters, good people may interpret this dream and may forget what the guy has done. But Yusuf doesn't just interpret the dream. Yusuf inter forgets everything that's happened in the past. Doesn't mention it. Doesn't mention it. Then interprets the dream. Because he knows it's urgent. And then he goes beyond the dream to give him advice. So he inter interprets the dream, gives advice, gives nasiha, and then gives him bushra, gives him good news. Good news to share. What does this tell you about this individual? Like... Right? It's, 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 it's another level. It's another level of nobility. It's another level of kindness. So he says, you will plant for seven consecutive years. Da'aban. means you have to plant extensively. You have to really plant as much as you can for the next seven years. Leaving in the ear of the grain whatever you can. Except what you eat. So, eat. so for seven years, you're going to plant more, much more than you usually do. And you're going <coughs> to take a little bit and eat for yourself. And then you're going to give or you're going to keep the rest closed in the ear. Because what happens when you keep it closed? You, keep, you, don't, you, know, you don't take the ears. It, it'll stay, yeah, longer shelf life. So look at that. He's already given them, at, like, he's going out of his way to not just interpret the dream, but to give advice. Then he says, After these seven years, there will come bad, another seven years that are really bad. Drought, famine. And these seven years will eat up what you've stored. So all these seven years, in the first seven years that you've saved, you will have to go into your reservoir and eat from that. Except the little that you stored, right? Previously, or the little that you stored for seed. So take a little bit of seed and try to still grow. So he's trying, he's giving him advice to maximize the yield. You're gonna seven years eat very little, so you have a lot more for the next seven years. And in that, don't try to plant too much because there won't be rain. So if you try to take the seeds and you save those seeds, there won't be rain. So take a little bit of seeds because there will still be some rain. There's still a little bit that will grow. That way you've maximized what you've eaten, you've maximized what you stored, and you've maximized what you could grow in the seven years that there's a drought and famine because there will still be a little bit of water and there will still be some yield. And then he gives them the good news. Then after that, the 15th year, on the 15th year, there will come a year that will be abundant in rain, there will be so much abundance that people will be squeezing. Squeezing what? Squeezing fruit. You know when you have so much fruit, you could squeeze fruit and you make juice. When you don't have much, you're just eating fruit. But say, I want to get exciting. Now you start making, you know, uh, all kinds of 
cocktails and mocktails and bakhwas like all that stuff. Mango lassi and you know, mashallah. You're gonna squeeze. You're gonna be squeezing all day long, right? Wa fihi yasirun. Now this is such such a such beautiful a beautiful way to do it, right? Now finally, finally, now that Yusuf didn't ask to be mentioned, the guy felt guilty. He's like, man, I went to Yusuf. Uh, he told me to mention him the first time. I forgot. And when I came back, he didn't ask me for anything. He didn't blame me. He didn't. None of that. So he remembered. He's like, you know what? I, I owe it to him to remember him. To find that he doesn't take credit for the dream. He goes, the interpretation. He goes, and he tells the king. And the king says what? وَقَالَ الْمَلِكُ أُؤْتُونِي بِهِ Now, let's go back to everything that we just said. There's another interpretation that's much more positive. Okay? There's a, so there, there are lots of these interpretations. One interpretation, before we go back and read the more positive interpretation, Husn al interpretation, this interpretation, this, this, the, the series of interpretations that we just had, one more says that the man didn't actually tell the king. The king had a dream. And in that dream, he finally saw that the dream interpretation came from Yusuf. There's a man, Yusuf, who interpreted the dream, not this guy. He's like, bring this guy to me. Bring him to me. And then finally he sent for a messenger to bring Yusuf out. So that's, that's been said. And that goes to show you that this guy is a complete flop. Like imagine the Mufassir who interpreted this. He's like, he just no, no faith in humanity. <laughs> Amjad is looking at me like I would have that interpretation. Huh? The first interpretation puts the man in more positive light than the second interpretation. There's a third interpretation that puts the man in a better light. When he says, La'al... Um, yeah, uh, give me the interpretation so I can go back and tell people so that they know you're innocent. So that they know, instead of know what to come and know what's going to happen, they know your innocence. So he came with the intention of actually proving Yusuf's innocence. That's very positive, Masha. We have, we have a commentator within the commentary, MashaAllah. MashaAllah. Alhamdulillah. Then Yusuf, Yusuf is asked to come by the king. وَقَالَ الْمَلِكُ أُتُونِي بِهِ Bring him to me. فَلَمَّا جَاءَهُ الرَّسُولُ When the messenger came. We don't know if it's the same guy or another messenger. Right? قَالَ ارْجِعْ إِلَى رَبِّكَ فَاسْأَلْهُ مَا بَالُ النِّسْوَةِ اللَّاتِ قَطَّعْنَ أَيْدِيَهُنْ Now I want you to listen to this carefully because this is amazing. Imagine Yusuf <coughs> Yusuf is asked by the king to come for interpreting this dream. The king wants to meet him. And why does the king want to meet him? Why does the king want to meet him? Al-Maliku. Hmm? Maybe no. Maybe, maybe to honor him. That's a very husn al To congratulate him, to reward him. This is the heroic version of storytelling. The, the Malik, to use him. This guy was able to interpret the dream. He has the audacity to interpret a dream. Nobody else wants to interpret the dream, but he's confident enough to interpret the dream. He doesn't want to reward him. He just wants to see him. I want to know who he is. Because in the second ayah, later on, he says, bring him to me so I can reward him. There's no reward here. Just the king is curious. I want to meet this guy. I want to meet him. I want to get to know him. I want to see who he is. Is he usable? Is he potentially an ally? And that's the way some people who are in power think. Sure, sounds like a great guy, but what, what, so what, so what? Great scholar, great knowledge, but so what, who cares? How is that going to benefit me? Of course, of course. And, and that's, a, that's a great point by a doctor saying, but if a king is asking even to meet somebody, to get to know somebody, that in itself is honor, like it's an honor. Like the king is taking interest in you, right? So you're right in that sense. But at this time, it's still, we're not going to clothe you and congratulate you. It's at this level, like, I want to know who you are. This is the job interview. He's being called for a job interview. In, in simple words. Now the messenger comes to him. The king wants to meet you. He's taking interest in you. Most of us at this time will be like, oh my God, the king wants to meet me. Let's go. Wow. Finally. But Yusuf says, Go back to your master. 
فاسأله and ask him ما بال النسوة اللاتي قطعن أيديهن ask him whatever happened to the women and about the case of the women who cut their hands إن ربي بكيدهن عليم because my lord is very well acquainted with their knowledge of like cunning of their plan so Yusuf Yusuf didn't say what happened to the wife of the Aziz because if he says what happened to the wife of the Aziz how is that going to be interpreted he still cares for her he's still thinking about her he might play into that narrative or out of respect he doesn't want to bring her in trouble like you know what I'm going to stay far away from that so he asked about the women who cut their hands so when he says this what is that supposed to say? What is that supposed to indicate to the Malik, to the king? Women who cut their hands, what do you mean? Oh, we had a case five years ago of women who cut their hands. And then it's in Rabbi Bikaidin Ali, my, my lord, meaning you, my king, knows well, very well what they're planning. Knows very well. I, of course, my lord. Nothing happens in my lord's kingdom without my lord's knowledge. I'm sure that you've had access to the files. I'm sure they were shown to you. I'm sure this is a decision that you have complete control over. So he's playing into that like your full knowledge. And some say, Rabbi, meaning my Lord. Allah. Allah knows very well what happened. But it's time for my Lord, the King, to know very well what happened. This could be understood in two ways. Number one, he's saying, you're, you're the Lord of this kingdom. And by default, you're my, you know, the Lord of the, I, I accept your kingship. I'm one of your subjects. This is a case that has happened five years ago. Look into it. But he's not going to tell the king to look into a case like, Whatever happened with the women who cut their hands? And in other ways, like, my Lord Allah knows the truth, so it's time for the king, who claims to be a king in his, like a lord in his, among his subjects, to also look into this case. So, قَالَ مَا خَطُبُكُنَّ It's like almost as if, next episode, next scene, the king is now brought these women in front of him, to ask them. Now he's interviewing personally. He's curious. Like, this is someone who interpreted dreams. This is someone who's giving me this answer. This is someone who doesn't want to meet me. He's given the opportunity to meet me and to get a job interview, but he doesn't want to come and tell an investigator this case. He's so intrigued. And the fact that this dream is coming over and over again makes him like, you know, it, it's all taking him completely, you know, focused, complete, taking his attention completely. So what, is, what does he say? مَا خَطُبُكُنَّ إِذْ رَوَتُنَّ يُوسُفَ عَنْ نَفْسِهِ what did you get? Like, what happened to you when you tried to seduce Yusuf? Now, wait a second. He's speaking to the women that cut their hands, but they're not the ones who tried to tempt Yusuf. So this goes to show you that he probably looked at the files. And by asking, by asking the women... What happened to Yusuf, the one that you tried to tempt? Their natural reaction would be like, no, no, no. We didn't try to tempt nobody. He's actually a really good person. He's innocent. It's she who tried to... You see the language here? So he's putting them in a position where they have to be defensive. And in being defensive, they admit the, the real culprit. It wasn't us that tempted. No, we didn't do anything. No, we didn't, it, uh, she's, so they would throw her under the bus. And that goes through the, king, the wisdom of the king. Or he brought her with them. And he didn't single her out. He asked all of them. So you women here who tried to tempt Yusuf, he doesn't single her out. He's just, she's there with them. So what happened when he tried to seduce Yusuf? Now before the women could you know, point to her and say she's the one, they responded and they said, First thing we have to admit is that Hashirillah, right? The Hashirillah is like, God forbid. We don't know any bad about him. We've never heard any bad about him. He's a, he's a good person. Then finally the wife of the Aziz steps in. Because this is it. This is make it or break it. It's all crumbling. So now finally that, like that security from underneath her is lifted and now she has to admit the truth. But in admitting the truth, the words that she uses indicate there's regret. Indicate there's maturity. Indicate there's, she's got some time to think about. This is, you know, a couple of years later. She's matured. She's thought about this. So what did she say? Now the truth has, like it has come to light. 
it has come, it's, it's as if the truth has been, you know, forced and kept closed in a bottle, and now the bottle is about to explode. Now the truth has come out. There's no choice. I have to say the truth now because everything is pointing to it. I seduced him. I tempted him. And he is the one that is speaking the truth. MashaAllah. We have a righteous woman who is fully transformed. Now she says this so that Joseph would know that I would not speak dishonestly about him in his absence. And certainly God does not guide those who are dishonest. You know, the Mufassirun read this in multiple ways. They say like, she's trying to play the self-righteous person even as she's admitting guilt. Like someone saying, Mom, yes, it was me who broke the table. But I tell you the truth so that you know you've raised a good son. It's like, Ta'ala, you're going to get hit anyway. <laughs> oh, you raised a good son. What is, this? What is emotional gymnastics? <laughs> right? It's, 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 so some have, some have actually, like, sorry, how do you break a table? Your creativity, mashallah. So, some have read it in that she's trying to portray herself as the self-righteous person, but she's still struggling with her nature of wanting to appear good. She's still struggling with that nature of wanting to dominate the conversation. So, she doesn't want others to... I'm not going to let you say my bad. I will admit it myself. But in admitting so, I want you to understand that it takes a lot. That I've done something extraordinary here. And then she realizes, she realizes that maybe that was a bit too much. So she takes a step back and she says, وَمَا أُبَرِّئُ نَفْسِي And I don't seek to absolve myself of blame. I'm not saying I'm innocent here. إِنَّ النَّفْسَ لَأَمَّارَةٌ بِالسُوءُ Look at the wisdom here. The nafs commands all of us to do bad. So none of you are better than me. You all have a nafs which commands bad. There's so many ways you can read this. You can read this as an innocent woman who's finally come to realize this, that she's actually genuine in saying this. And she's like struggling with her emotions of like, don't, don't, say I'm, don't, say, don't think you're better than me. It took, it took a lot of me to say this, to admit the truth. So, so let me at least maintain my dignity in, in that. Or it could be like you're struggling back and forth between that display of appearing to be innocent while also... You know, not wanting to appear to be so self-righteous. And then others have said this whole thing was like a, a, a pretend admission. Which is not, I don't think that's true. I think there's a bit of, at least some sincerity here in her admission. Tamam? And then finally after this, what does she say? Inna Rabbi ghafoorur rahim. She says, all of the, all of the nafs is constantly encouraging, commanding us all to do bad. Except the one that my Lord shows mercy to, for indeed my Lord is most forgiving, most merciful. This plays double, it plays double, it's a double meaning. It's like, had it not been for the grace of my Lord, I would not have been able to admit this mistake. All of us have the wiswas except the ones that my Lord shows mercy to. And indeed, my Lord is most forgiving, most merciful. That's the Lord of all of us, but you're the Lord of the. So if, if the Lord of all lords forgives, what about you? Are you not going to forgive? Do, do, do you see that? Right? Is it intentional? Is it just an, a, 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 a moment of emotion where she's literally just speaking her heart and the words happen to be coincidentally good enough for the Lord to like, you know what? Things happen. She comes from a powerful community, powerful position. She's not going to be put in jail or any of that. It's That apology is enough. Right? And for Yusuf, it's more than enough. He just wants his innocence. Now, the reason why Yusuf didn't want to go out of jail the first time is because he went out of jail the first time. What would people have said? The king needed him to interpret dreams, so he took him out. This is like a, what do you call it? A, presiden a presidential par pardon, right? Undeserved, but conveniently needed. An exertion of power. Right? But he doesn't want to go out of jail without his dignity restored to him before his freedom. 
That's a very important lesson in life. Dignity sometimes is more important than your freedom. But the Prophet Muhammad in Sahih al Bukhari, he mentions, he mentions, had it been me in jail, I would have not, I would have not done that. Yeah, I would not have asked the king to go and I would not have done that. Right? La Jabtu Rasul. I would have answered the messenger. I would have went with the messenger. Right? <coughs> now this shows us a few things. So wait wait a second. If the Prophet Muhammad himself is saying, I would have went with the messenger, what is he saying? He's saying that this is legislation for the Ummah. The words of the Prophet Muhammad become binding on all of us. So he's showing us if you have an opportunity to get out of jail and then work things out, get out of jail. Get, get your freedom first, then work, work around getting your dignity. Because if you tell the messenger, go back <laughs> to your king and see what happened with the women, it's a bit of a risk. But Yusuf doesn't care. He's accepted. He's I'm here, khalas, I'm comfortable, no problem. Even if I have to die here, I'm, my, I've, 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 he's already like he's been in it too deep. Yeah? He's too many years now gone to get out, get his freedom without his dignity. No way. But the Prophet Muhammad is giving legislation for the ummah. Be practical. If you can get out <coughs> and restore your freedom and then work on it, don't take too many risks. That's one. The other one is that he probably said it in a metaphorical way. Like, ta'ajjuban min sabr Yusuf. You know when he says, like, wow, had it been me, I would not have done that. You probably would have. But you're saying that to express your amazement with Yusuf's patience. Some have interpreted that way. And some have said it to say that he's complimenting Yusuf's patience, but he's giving a way out for his ummah if they were in a similar position. That you don't, if you're able to find a way out of jail, you find a way out of jail legally. Some of you are like, well, even illegally. Don't jailbreak. Bye. Inshallah. Now, um, let's. Um, yeah, let's, uh, let's finish maybe three, four more ayat until uh, when Yusuf's brothers come to him. The next section, the next episode, or the next scene, we have the Malik saying, bring him to me. Now that his innocence is proven, the Malik says, bring him to me, astakhlishu li nafsi. Bring him to me so I can em- employ him exclusively in my service. So imagine the king works directly with a few individuals. Very, like, very few people get to meet the king directly, one-on-one. Most people answer to somebody who asks somebody who asks, they're part of the system, part of the royal family, part of the executive power, but they don't report directly to the king. But Yusuf is being called to work directly with the king. Now there's something else that's important here. Do we see the word pharaoh here? This is not a pharaoh. Even though pharaoh is known in the Quran, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps repeating king, 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 king. What are other versions of the story say? They say the pharaoh. But if you look at history, this time in which Yusuf entered Egypt, the pharaohs were not in charge. It was the Hexus kings. They were kings, not pharaohs. So this actually goes to show you the detail of the Quran. If the Quran was just copying from the Bible, it would have said the pharaoh. And it would have re, re, you know, introduced or reaffirmed the claim in the Bible, in the, in the Torah. But it doesn't. It says the king, the king, the king. And not just once. وَقَالَ الْمَلِكُ 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 Why does it say Rabb? If The difference in a king and a pharaoh is that pharaohs are Egyptian. The kings are from outside. They are from like, you know, Iraqi, Persian, that region, descent, and they come to, the, to rule. So they were ruling Egypt. They were basically colonizers. Yeah, from outside. They were not Egyptian. Right? So just keep that in mind. And it's very important for the story of how the Banu Israel enter Egypt. Finally, finally, when Yusuf and the king had a conversation, Yusuf was, you know, the, the king was impressed with Yusuf. To a point where he said to him, On this day today, you have earned our respect and earned our trust. Amin. You have the capacity, you now have the capacity to choose any position and I'll give it to you because you've earned my trust. Now, what, what does this show? Also, this, this reaffirms the notion that there's been so much distrust that this king, when he finds this level of integrity and genuine, he's like, I'm not going to give that up. 
This is so rare in this day and age that I'm willing to invest in you. You're a man of integrity. And having this conversation with him, everything proven, he wants to invest in him. Even though this is Hex, he's a Hexus and Yusuf is not from the Hexus. He's from Ben Israel. He's an Israelite. But he still trusts this genuineness. So what does he say? What does Yusuf say? إِجْعَنِّي عَلَى خَزَائِنِ الْأَرْضِ إِنِّي حَفِيظٌ عَلِيمٌ You know who I am? You trust me? You want to give me a position? Put me in charge of the treasury. Allow me to control the money in this community. For I am truly reliable and I'm truly knowledgeable. Like this is a knowledge that Allah has given me and I will be able to use it for good and you will find me to be reliable. And this goes to show in moments where you have to speak about yourself in job interviews, don't be afraid to fully sell yourself. What position do you want? Uh, it's okay, I can start with an entry position. If you, can, if you deserve the CEO position, I want to be the CEO. If you deserve it, you speak. like If, if you deserve it, if you're the best person for it. Now, wait a second. How does this go? Because this may seem contradictory with our... Jazakallah khair, Habib. May Allah bless you. This may seem contradictory with our notion of don't look for, don't look for uh, power. Let power find you. The Prophet Muhammad Sallam taught the community, taught the Muslims, don't go to a position. Don't look for a position, especially in leadership. Rather, put yourself up in a, place yourself in a position where your trustworthiness and, 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 and integrity speaks for itself and you're offered that position. But that's what's happening to Yusuf. That's exactly what happened to Yusuf, number one. And two, Yusuf knows what's going to happen for the next 14 years. This is a crisis. In a moment of crisis, you don't just sit there and be like, well, I'm not the best person for the job. Someone else out there is much more qualified than I am. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, you know, one-eyed king is the uh, one-eyed man is king in the land of the blind. You know that attitude of like I'm, I'm not the be- I'm not equipped. No, 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 no. This is a crisis. People are dying. Everybody has to step up at that time. When there's a fire, and there are no firefighters around, you don't sit there and be like, listen, I did not go to fire school. I can't. We cannot do this. We're gonna cause a lot more danger. We have to wait for the firefighters to come. Or worse, you know what I've seen. Imagine there's a city where there's no firefighters. Like, no, this is a job by firefighters. We should not step in. So what should we do? We should build schools to train firefighters. And until that happens, all the fires were absolved of the responsibility of having to put them out. This sounds like a bizarre example, but we do this on a day-to-day basis in the Muslim community. Not my problem. Not my problem. This is not my issue. Sorry, I cannot get involved. Not my issue, not my issue. Actually, you know, it becomes everybody's issue. Until somebody is dealing with it professionally, exclusively, with the best practices, until that happens, it becomes all of our issues. Whatever it is, every issue in the community that is not being dealt with by an exclusive group that is dealing with it proficiently enough, becomes our issue collectively. Is that clear? Now, wait a second. Pause for a second. The Hexus... The Hexus, based on what we know, they were not implementing you know, Islamic practice, right? So a lot of people use this, and I'll finish with this, but this is an important point. This is perhaps the most important point out of all this in, in our context. Some people use this example, say Yusuf worked for non-Muslims and became an executive in a state that is not Muslim. So therefore, it is halal for me to also work in a non-Muslim state. Interesting, very interesting, and there are Muslims who say that Muslim scholars, but they put some conditions, and that's why we need to be very careful. If your presence is going to allow you to freely implement positive changes, go for it. But if you're going to be locked within a system where you have to regurgitate a specific set of principles in order for you to survive and end up becoming a consumer more than a producer, then you're not that's not allowed. But if you're going to go in there to prevent harm and to increase representation, then know that it's haram. But you're in there because of necessity and you're in there to help prevent an issue which could get a lot worse. Is that clear? You can't be like, we have a lot of issues in the community, therefore we need representation everywhere. So we need to go everywhere. Right? If we have Muslim bartenders... 
then when those people in bar are having conversations about Islam in a bad way, you can stop it. And when those two people are drunk and they're like, Muslims are this. No, Muslims are not this. I'm Muslim, bro. Don't mess. My name is Muhammad. And if you have a problem with Islam, I'm going to knock you out. Astaghfirullah. Some people have the attitude. Go everywhere that's haram. Be everywhere. It doesn't matter. Haram or haram. Don't. It's, the, it's a matter of existentialism now. So the rules in haram and halal, those become secondary to our survival as a community. We need to come up with new principles based on the lens of survival. This literally goes against the whole story of Yusuf. If it was about survival from the beginning for this man, the story would have went in a very, very different way. Right? Very different way. So keep that in mind. But at the same time, understand that we're living in very difficult times and times of fitna. So even when advising those who lean towards that, have husnul dhan that they're trying to do this to protect the community. They're not trying to do this because they have ill intention for the community, most of them. But at the same time, we have to be clear and not misuse evidence, you know, like extended evidence beyond its context. Extend an evidence beyond its context. Because number one, this is not the shara of Islam. This is before Islam. This is not even like, this is a story that comes from Yusuf alayhi salam who is bound by different set of principles. But if you say that the shara of people came before us still has the same weight as the shara of Islam, there are, there are certain contexts here which become important. Number one, Yusuf is told by the king, you're Makin, bro. You do whatever you want. I trust you. So if you tell me that X, and I believe why? No, I'll go with you. So he has, he has a lot of control here. He's, he's able to change the system from within. And this crisis, if he doesn't step up, he's actually sinful. Because he has the trust, he has the buy-in, they, they, want to, they want him to change things. So he comes in and he does a lot of revolution and change. A lot of institutional reform. But you can't come into a place where you're, you're, you're a minority, you're not respected, you, you know, and, and then expect to... So the qiyas here has to be carefully rethought. Tamam? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the next two ayat, very, very subhanAllah, important for us to think about. I'm going to ask you a question before we finish. What did the Prophet Muhammad say whenever he saw something beautiful? MashaAllah. Something impressive, he would say, MashaAllah, Allahumma barik. But I'm talking about something beautiful as in like <clears throat> from the material, material world that catches your eye. You, for example, you're driving and you find a nice Ferrari, a nice Lambo. Yusuf has already got up from his seat. He's jumping up and down. As soon as I said the word Ferrari, the guy is flying. Mashallah. So what do we, uh, what do, Yusuf is a new revert, mashallah. Make dua for him. May Allah give him thabat, ya Rabbi Amin. He accepted Islam like a, couple of, a couple of days ago. Um, what, do, what did the Prophet Muhammad Sallam say when he saw something like that captures your eye. La hawla la quwwata illa billah. That's good. Good guess. So subhanallah, mashallah, that's when he was amazed by something, right? If something captured his eye that was beautiful, right, captivating, he would say, Allahumma la aisha illa aisha al-akhirah. Oh Allah, there's no true beauty and true life except the beauty and the life in the akhirah. So imagine being able to appreciate beauty but centralize that moment with the lens and through the lens of the akhirah. A lot of us would say, Allahumma rabbana atina fi dunya hasanatan wa fil akhirati hasanatan wa qina adhaab al nar. Oh Allah, give me good in this dunya, give me good in the hereafter and protect me from the hellfire. Because, because what, what could that do? It could get you to be actually seduced by that desire, right? So you trick yourself, you convince of that. I, I'm not actually attached to it, I'm just doing it for Islam. I'm doing, I want to show the world that you could be the best Muslim and you could be driving a $500,000 Lambo, custom made, you know. That's my intention. And when you get into that car, like, forget Islam, bro. You're, you're playing the best music, yeah, astaghfirullah. Yeah, and you're like jazzing. Come on, be honest. So in order to prevent that, like that, you know, that self-deception or room for it, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu would say, Allahumma la aisha illa aisha al-akhirah. Oh Allah, there's no true life except the life of the akhirah. Because even if you were to get that Ferrari now, you know that it's nothing compared to what you have with Allah in the akhirah. 
So to, to own something, to be, to be able to appreciate it, but to not be owned by it, it's very difficult. And you can easily convince yourself that, no, 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 that's not what's happening here, but that's exactly what's happening here. So that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the next two ayat, listen to this carefully, 56 and 57, We gave Yusuf the power in the earth to room freely wherever he wills. To settle wherever he wills. نُصِيبُ بِرَحْمَتِنَا مَنْ نَشَاءُ And we give from our mercy to whomever we will. And yasha in another riwayah. To whomever he wills. Meaning the person who struggles in the sight of Allah. نُصِيبُ بِرَحْمَتِنَا مَنْ يَشَاءُ Whoever wants this path, you want the mercy of Allah, do what Yusuf did. Say no to temptation. It'll get harder. Continue to be disciplined. It'll get even harder. Continue to be committed. Don't break. Show, allow this to change you on the inside. Allah will give you khair. You may not be the, you may not end up being the minister of finance in the World Bank, but Allah may give you something much, much better. Allah may give. I don't, nobody knows what it is, but Allah may give you something in the most unexpected of ways. Allah asserts and reminds you, we will not waste or discount the reward of the people of good. Then Allah mentions, and this is the rule, وَلَأَجْرُ الْآخِرَةِ خَيْرٌ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَكَانُوا يَتَّقُونَ And the reward in the hereafter is much better for those that have iman, those who believe, and those who have taqwa, those who have protective boundaries that they've set to protect themselves from being in a place where Allah is displeased with them. May Allah make us people of iman, people of taqwa. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honor us, Ya Rabb, ameen. May Allah accept from all of us, Ya Rabb, ameen, and allow us to walk through the steps of Yusuf, alayhi salam. I believe next week we have the food bank happening, so please uh, read the WhatsApp. Inshallah, we might be pushing the class either a little bit earlier, a little bit later, or we might be moving it to Sunday, so just keep, uh, you know, inshallah, uh, access in the WhatsApp group, and we'll give you the update there, inshallah. So, Al, tfaddan. Salam. Tfaddan. Of course. Absolutely. 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 Yeah. What's Abu Ish? Abu Ish Habibi? Abu Nasr. Oh, Nasr. Said Nasr. Ustad Nasr is reminding us about the hadith of istafti qalbak just to close the door for, you know, misuse of the hadith. Follow your heart, you know, ask your heart for fatwa. He says that in matters of halal and haram, you don't ask your heart for fatwa. Like, uh, you know, it's like imagine, and, and I've seen this actually very dangerous. Someone says, I want to buy a, a winery. It makes a lot of money. I know it's haram, but in the context that we're living in today, you know, maybe there's khair in it for the community. I don't know any other Muslims that own wineries. Maybe, you know, we can use it for da'wah. Maybe we'll put like an ayah of the Quran in every bottle before we say Some bakwas like that, right? You can't, that's nonsense. You, you can't say I'm going to ask myself for fatwa in matters of halal and haram that are clear. It's just in matters of ambiguity or gradients in the areas that are gray, where, you know, it might be this, it might be that. That's where you look within you. And as we said, if you're inside, if, you're, if your core is clean, that's when you can look within. But if you're noisy and distracted and exposed to too much distraction, then that compass is not even good enough to give you that direction to begin with. Jazakumullah khair. We'll see you next week, inshallah. If you're not on the WhatsApp group, please get it from somebody who is so that we can update you about next week's class.